Hello everyone, Loremaster of Sotek here, and I'm continuing my little tour of things around the Warhammer-verse that have happened in my little time off, and that brings me to some really exciting things that have happened, which you can see behind me here, which is that a lot of the rules for Warhammer the Old World have actually been released. Basically, Games Workshop is doing kind of a weekly series where they put out a set of the rules to kind of ease us into what Warhammer the Old World is going to look like. So, without further ado, let's kind of dive in and see what we're dealing with. So, they have released three articles so far, which I'm just going to do all of them together in this video. I'm not going to split them up. So, we have the, whatever this first phase is, and then I believe they've also done the movement phase and the shooting phase. So, let's delve into it. Uh, they have, of course, confirmed that the Old World is coming out in 2024, which I'm very, very excited about. It's supposed to come out very early 2024. Um, which matches up with things that I've heard. I am extremely excited for the return of the old world, but let's see what we're actually dealing with in regards to rules. Oh man, this is, this art is from, uh, I want to say sixth edition or no, this, mm, this may have been seventh edition because I'm pretty sure it's six, but it, it could very well be seventh because, uh, the seventh edition starter set, no, eighth edition starter set was Island of Blood, which was, Greenskins versus High Elves, but I'm pretty sure this predates that because this is about Grom's invasion. Um, anyway, so we're looking at the strategy phase. Okay, so this will be kind of interesting because the strategy phase didn't really exist uh, in tabletop that I played. Now, I do want to be clear that I played Warhammer Fantasy tabletop from 6th edition onwards. I did not play 5th edition or any of the prior editions. So do kind of keep that in mind if you're someone that did play really old Hammer at this point. Um, or uh, if you're kind of looking for what my take is on things. Because I have seen some conversations comparing various editions. There's kind of the old joke that, you know, if you take a bunch of Warhammer Fantasy fans and put them all in the same room, they're all probably going to vehemently disagree with one another on which edition was the worst and which edition was the best. Um... But uh, I do have a lot of fond memories of all three editions that I played, 6th, 7th, and 8th, which did run for quite a long time. Um, they, they had their ups and downs. You know, I don't think any of them was perfect, but um, they had different strengths and weaknesses. I think when it came to genuine tactical play, 6th edition was a very, very strong edition. But there were a lot of elements about it that I was not very fond of. Um, Sixth edition uh, had very abusive magic in the sense that there were some factions that could just get pretty much unlimited power dice and just farm. Uh, looking at you, vampire counts, uh, just spamming raise dead until the world would blow up. But um, and it was also very distinctly possible to run some pretty obnoxious characters in sixth. Um, and a lot of the special characters were super nasty, but granted in sixth edition, a lot of the special characters weren't necessarily depending on like your local tourney scene. Um, you weren't allowed to have them sometimes it depended on what was going on, but I mean, every edition had problems. Um, a lot of people bitch about the later editions, but I have a lot of fond memories of the later editions. Um, you know, they had their problems, but they had a lot of really awesome highlights as well. So anyway. With that on the way, let's go ahead and dive into it. So, Warhammer the Old World is a new game designed from the ground up to simulate large regiments meeting combat as volleys of arrows and artillery shoot, shot, soar overhead, and cavalry, wizards, heroes, and monsters crash into combat all around them. That's not to say it hasn't taken lots of inspiration from what came before it, including several popular editions of Warhammer Fantasy Battles. Much of the complexity has been kept and regarding morale added, but a lot has been put into the structure of the phases. So, we have four phases in a turn. So the strategy phase, the movement phase, the shooting phase, and the combat phase. So this is close to what we had uh, in the editions that I really played. Generally speaking, back in fantasy, it was usually the movement phase, the magic phase, the shooting phase, the charge. Wait, was charge charge phase was not separate? Hmm. Oh man, it's been so long. Because I want to say there were five phases. Maybe it was, maybe I'm, maybe it was movement, magic, shooting, combat, combat resolution. That might be, it, it, it doesn't matter. Um, 
I, like, I've still got my books over there, but I'd have to go dig them all out. They're kind of all stuck together in a pile. But let's see what we're dealing with here. So the strategy phase. Uh, during the strategy phase, the active player attempts to cast enchantment or hex spells and make use of certain special rules before attempting to rally any fleeing units. Okay, so the strategy phase seems like it may be kind of similar to the uh, the hero phase that we currently have in Age of Sigmar, which in Age of Sigmar, the hero phase is the very first phase of the turn, and it's where a lot of your characters like issue various commands or uh, you cast spells. Um, but I do like that Rally Fling Units is back at the start of the turn, uh, so it's good to see that rallying has returned as a concept and fleeing units are still going to be in the game as a concept. As much as I do enjoy Age of Sigmar a lot, which I really, really like Age of Sigmar, um, the gameplay and the lore and all everything about it, um, the battle shock system, so the idea of like your units fleeing from battle, I find to be particularly poorly implemented uh, because it's non-existent. Basically, it's just that if a unit takes a certain amount of damage, they will roll a dice, and if the number that you roll plus the m amount of models you lost is larger than your bravery, then that many models, like the difference, uh, run off or just die instantly because they like run off the table. Which I'm I'm just not a huge fan of that. Uh, I really enjoyed the whole concept of like units actually running away on the table, but there was a chance for them to come back. Uh, and like get their stuff together or they could potentially like be hazards to enemies and allies because they're like moving in the way and stuff as they're running for their lives. Um, God, I'm so excited for old, old movement. Um, but that's interesting that enchantments and hexes specifically are in, uh, the strategy phase. And we can, I can see looking ahead a little bit that it looks like magic is going to be in every single phase. So wizards are no longer going to have a singular phase where they matter and then they just don't matter. Uh, instead, they're going to matter in every single phase, which is going to be very, very interesting. I'm curious how that's going to function in with like a dispel system, especially for armies that don't have wizards, like dwarfs and things like that. Uh, I'm curious with wizards being able to impact every phase of the game. Um, it, now, it could be that your wizard is only allowed to have a certain amount of spells and you can only cast in those phases if you have a relevant spell as opposed to your wizard has a spell for every phase. Uh, I imagine that would pr that's probably going to be locked to more powerful characters, but we'll see. So we have Enchantment or Hex, which I'm assuming an enchantment is basically what we used to call an augment spell. So uh, a Hex is like a debuff that you throw on an enemy. Enchantment, I assume, is like an augment, which was a buff you would put on a friendly unit. And then special rules, hopefully, I assume that's going to be things like stupidity or other unique rules um, that could affect particular units like stupidity, frenzy, and stuff like that. Uh, the movement phase. The movement phase starts with the declaration of charges and of charge reactions, then the movement of charging units. After this comes compulsory movement. Awesome. So compulsory movement's back. Finally, any remaining movement is carried out and conveyance spells are cast. All right. So like movement spells. That's really interesting. So conveyance spells, I'm, I'm curious if like a hex spell would be a spell that could affect enemy movement or because it's related to the movement phase, if you would cast a conveyance spell instead, for instance, to like make an enemy unit's uh, movement cut in half uh, to make them slower or something like that, or to make it where they don't, uh, their charge isn't as long, but we'll have to see the shooting phase. During the shooting phase, the active player shoots with those units in their army armed with missile weapons with their war machines and attempts to cast magic missile and magical vortex spells. Okay, so magic vortexes are back. Very cool. I'm very interested to see if templates are going to be back. So in Warhammer Fantasy, we had three different kinds of templates, which are not a thing in Age of Sigmar, um, which a template is they were these like see through pieces of plastic. There was a three inch circle template. There was a five inch circle template and then there was a flame template which was like a teardrop straight a, a teardrop shape and it was roughly eight inches long um but uh and they were for different kinds of missile weapons and spells so like uh, a stone thrower or a catapult would shoot the uh, would usually shoot the little three inch template um and like certain magical vortexes use the three inch template uh, mortars would often use the three inch template, but there were some like larger war machines that could unleash the five inch template, or there were like really, really, you could like overcast your vortex spells 
to make them use the five inch template. And then the flame template was for things like uh, flame cannons, uh, the salamanders of the lizard men and other similar type units. Um, and then we have the combat phase. During this phase, units fight in deadly hand-to-hand -hand melee and wizards attempt to fend off their attackers with assailment spells. Units that have lost combat may be driven back or become broken and flee. At the end of this phase, once all combats have been resolved, the active player's turn ends. So I will say that just based on this, this seems very similar to me uh, to old Warhammer Fantasy rules. But let's see what they actually try to do the phase as. So the game is round in turns. Uh, each game has a number of rounds. During each round, both players take a turn. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, and then there are also, each phase also has four sub phases. All right. So there's, okay, so you get turns, which have, no, you have rounds. So you have a round, which has two turns. Each turn is comprised of four phases, and each phase is comprised of four sub phases. Cool. The strategy phase. We begin with the start of turn subphase, which is when certain units perform special actions or take tests. These aren't common, and their details will be clearly stated in their rules. For example, stone trolls will take stupidity tests. Awesome. So psychology is back. Very excited for the return of psychology. I do hope psychology is, in, is as in-depth as it was back in 6th edition, 7th and 8th. Um, I really, really enjoyed rules like stupidity, hatred, fear, terror, uh, frenzy. Those were all very, very panic. They were all very fun rules that I think really added a lot of life to the table. Um, granted, they could be kind of complex. Um, if this game's even close to the old games, it may be a little bit of a shocker for people that have not played Warhammer Fantasy. Like they've only played Age of Sigmar or maybe uh, more recent editions of 40k. The, the rules for fantasy were pretty dense uh, compared to anything else. Um, like old 40k was, I think, just as dense, but uh, I believe 40k is much more like H of Sigmar ish these days, where the rules have been heavily simplified, um, which is not a bad thing by any means. Um, it's just different. It's also when Night Goblin Fanatics will be placed on the table. Interesting. So Night Goblin Fanatics would be at the start of the turn sub phase. Okay, that's that's a very interesting change. So it used to be that Night Goblin Fanatics were like a reaction type move. So it would be that. If you had a unit of night goblins and an enemy unit and the enemy unit moved within a certain distance, I want to say it was like nine inches. Uh, it was either nine or six. Uh, was it 12? It was either nine or 12. It doesn't matter. But whenever you got close enough to a night goblin unit and they had fanatics in them, they would declare that they were going to throw their fanatics. So you would have to stop your movement and they would put all their fanatics down and the fanatics would immediately like take a move. Um, and then from then on out, they would move during the compulsory movement phase. Um, so it's very interested to me that the night goblin fanatics would move during the start of turn phase. Cause to me, that seems to be more that it's going to be a system where the night goblin player has to choose to throw out the fanatics as opposed to just having them kind of wound up and ready to start chucking at people. Uh, additionally, a particular scenario may require you to check whether a victory condition has been met at this point. You may also use this period to tidy the table, removing casualties and errant dice. The second sub phase is more exciting. Command phase. Okay, cool. So we are going to get, we are functionally going to get the hero say, or the hero phase from Age of Sigmar, which I think is good. Um, I think that's going to be a really excellent way to help fantasy characters feel more helpful out of, outside of just combat. Um, because the problem, in my opinion, with a lot of the old fantasy characters is many of them were just not useful outside of dealing damage. Um, one of the things I really, really like about Age of Sigmar is how many characters have fun little abilities, whether they're active commands or passive auras and stuff like that, that allow you to augment your troops in various ways that I think better represent what effect characters should be having on the table. Um, obviously, you do want to still have your beat stick characters, but the you know you also want characters that are good at being characters and commanders. Uh, this is when most characters' special rules fire off. For instance, a Bretonian lord brandishing the falcon horn of Threademund may blow it in the command subphase, hopefully preventing opponents from being able to fly. This ancient horn was used by the Grail companion uh, Duke Threademund Aquitaine. When blown, it emits a piercing cry, and the skies become filled with flocks of hunting birds. 
During the command subphase, if they are not engaged in combat, this character may attempt to use the Falcon Horn by making a leadership test using his own unmodified leadership. Ooh, boy, there's a there's a phrase that gives flashbacks unmodified leadership. If this test is passed until the start of your next turn of subphase, enemy units cannot use the fly rule. What? <laughs> that is so strong. Oh, my God. That's ridiculously strong. Okay, so you could just be like, yeah, fuck you. You don't get to fly. Um, also, I'm curious if this can be used every command phase, because this seems kind of bonkers. Um, cause it's not like once per game. It's just like, no, fuck them. They don't get to fly. Um, I do find it interesting that the fly rule has an X, which indicates that fly is going to have like a value. So like, you'll be able to fly 10 inches or 20 inches or 15 inches or whatever. Um, cause in fantasy, we just had the fly rule and the hover rule, um, which fly just meant you could fly 10 inches period. Um, hover also meant that. But what was the difference between them is that if you could fly, you could do a march move, which would allow you to double your movement. So you could move 20 inches instead of only moving 10 inches. Uh, whereas if you had the hover rule, you could not march. Uh, you could only fly 10 inches and that was it. Uh, but anyway, w where would Warhammer be without magic? You'll note that there's no magic phase in the game. Instead, magical powers and spells are cast during the relevant phases. For instance, uh, Hand of Gork or Mork is a conveyance spell, which means it's cast in the movement phase. That's very, very interesting. Uh, I do like that quite a bit. Um, Hand of Gork, which is what it used to be, but I guess now it's Hand of Mork, but it doesn't really matter because it's or Gork or, or Mork, depending on how you look at it. Um, that spell, I hated that spell. Uh, it was like a, it was such a good spell for green skin players uh, because it literally allowed them to like pick a unit and the hand of Gork literally would like scoop them up and put them down somewhere else on the battlefield. So they would benefit from, <laughs> they would benefit from getting, uh, they would basically get to just move somewhere else on the table, which was bonkers at times. Uh, it was so strong. Uh, however, the third step of the strategy phase is conjuration, which is when you cast enchantments, magical boosts for your allies. Okay. So augments or hexes, which are magical penalties to your enemies. Players take it in turns during the step to choose wizards who aren't fleeing to attempt to cast spells. The Tomb Kings, for instance, might choose to cast uh, Joff's Incantation of Cursed Blades from the lore of Nehekara. What's the casting value? We'll go more into detail on magic during another article. Okay, the lore of Nehekara. Uh, as the Lich Priest merges this ancient mantra, the weapons of the Nehekaran warriors gathered about them become imbued with the essence of Joff, uh, Yif, uh, the jackal-headed god of the dead who hungers for the soul of living above all things. So it's enchantment. As a casting value of seven. Oh, the, the range is self. That's... Oh, whoa. Okay, the caster has a command range? Until your next start of turn subphase, any friendly unit that has the Nehekar and Undead special roll, and that is within the caster's command range, may re-roll any rolls to hit of a natural one. Okay, so this is actually really significant in that, first of all, um, command range on your spells. That's a fascinating phrase. Because that means it's not the spell itself that's dictating how far reaching your spells are, but instead how good of a character your character is, which I really, really like. Because this could mean that like a hero level Lich Priest could have maybe a six inch range um, where he casts and affects everyone within six inches of him. Or uh, if you have a high Lich Priest, it could be 12 inches. And then if you have like Cetra the Imperishable, it could be 18 inches. I really, really like that. Um, I think that's going to go really far to introducing the concept. Oh my God, I like that so much because that's really going to be another awesome way to introduce the concept of wizards having different levels of power without it just being that they get more dice or they get more spells. Um, I really like the idea that the spell itself will be more powerful or more reliable um, because the caster is of an appropriate level. That's really, really awesome. Um, the other thing is that rerolls are back, which I'm very, uh, that's awesome. I'm pretty cool with that. Um, Age of Sigmar, one of the things that's very interesting they've done with AOS is there are no rerolls, like at all. Uh, rerolls have almost entirely, if not completely, been exterminated from the game. Um, uh, they were a pretty big thing in second edition, but in the modern edition of Age of Sigmar, rerolls are like completely gone. Um, which is not a bad thing by any means. It speeds the game up a lot uh, because like you, you have a system of like ones always fail. 
Um, and you don't have to worry about like rerolling certain rolls. Um, it, it, I will be the first to like, be like, yeah, it sped up the game a ton. Um, doesn't necessarily mean it's like good or bad. Um, but fantasy, I, fantasy will not be a fast game. Like <laughs> there is no way this game is going to be quick. Um, these rules are looking like they're probably going to be roughly as dense as like six edition was at least. Um, and six edition was busy uh, depending on what the movement phase looks like. Uh, the final step in this phase is rally fleeing troops. This is when the active player must attempt to rally all of their units that are fleeing to take a rally test, choose a unit, and roll two dice against his leadership characteristic. If you fail, it will continue to flee during the movement phase. If you pass, your unit is allowed to free reform move and returns to the Oh, free reforms! Oh, man, I'm so excited for movement. We'll have more on morale in a later article, too, but please do bear in mind that if your unit is under half strength, it gets a minus one modifier to its leadership when attempting to rally. Under 25%, you need a natural double one. Oh, they brought back insane courage. That's so cool. So, okay, that's really awesome. So it used to be back in uh, Warhammer Fantasy that if a unit was fleeing and they were below 25%, you just, they would not rally unless you roll a double one. Um, I I really like the, the idea that if they're under half strength, they get a minus one penalty. That's really cool. The fact that it kind of like gradually goes down to needing double ones. Um, or Well, okay, maybe not super gradually, but there's at least a halfway point where you take a bit of a penalty. Um, that's very cool. I'm very, very excited to see Rally Rules are back. It's interesting that Rally is at the very end of the command phase or the strategy phase. Uh, it makes sense. Um, but I do like that quite a bit because one of the things that could be a little ridiculous about Old Fantasy was like Wizards. For instance, uh, it would not be uncommon for, like, if you're fighting an enemy unit to break them or an enemy unit flees from you that has a wizard in it and they get away. And then on that player's turn, the wizard would rally and then immediately cast a spell. Um, I like that this has the rally phase at the very end of the command phase so that regardless of what your characters do, uh, regardless if they're a wizard or like a big commander with abilities or whatever, if they're fleeing at the start of your turn, you just don't get to use all of their cool abilities uh, because they're too busy running for their lives and no one's going to listen to the boss that is running for his life like a coward. Um, that's really, really cool. Uh, there's a lot more to clue you on for Warhammer the Old World in the coming months. Ugh. We'll be tackling the rest of the phases, plus rules for magic, morale, psychology, and other matters. And we'll also be taking a closer look at the factions, the setting, the models, and the future of the game. Only here on WarhammerCommunity.com. So I will say uh, the strategy phase and the turn sequence look really, really good. I love, 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 love the idea that magic is now throughout the game instead of just being one phase. Uh, I think that's going to make magic a lot more manageable and also a little, I'm, I'm curious, I'm very curious what the limitations are on it are going to be. Like if a wizard a, is a wizard going to know a spell for every single phase? Or are they only going to be able to know a selection of spells and they have to choose which phases they're going to like just not have a spell for? I'm also curious if there's going to be a limit on how many spells they can cast at a turn. So like even if you do have a spell for like the strategy phase, um, the shooting phase, and the combat phase, for instance, let's say you had a spell for all three of those phases, but what if your wizard can only cast twice? So you have to figure out which two phases you're going to cast in uh, because you have like limitations on that. Um, and then I'm also curious like how dispelling is going to work because it used to be that there was kind of a limit on how much you could dispel um, because your opponent would have a set amount of power dice, which as long as they had power dice, they could attempt to cast a spell and you would have an amount of dispel dice. And as long as you had an, some dispel dice, you could try to stop them from casting. Um, Age of Sigmar has a very simplified system where if you if you have a wizard, they can cast however many spells they know, um, however many spell slots they have, and your opponent uh, can attempt to unbind for however many unbind slots you have. Um, so I'm curious if that's how it's going to work as well. Like if your opponent, um, if you have a wizard that can cast three spells, right, and you're like, okay, I can cast in three of the four phases but I know my opponent only has two dispels, then can you have a system of trying to bait out 
his dispel attempts in like the strategy phase so that he doesn't have any dispels left for the shooting phase. So then you are more freed up to unleash magic missiles and vortex spells. Um, very, very curious what all of like the nuance is going to be between them and a uh, holy mother of crap. So, uh, I just realized how long I've been talking. I changed my mind. <laughs> this is not going to be all of them. Uh, I am just going to do one phase per video because apparently these are going to be like 30 minute videos. So, uh, thank you all for watching. Please do let me know, uh, down below what you think of the strategy rules. How are you feeling about them so far? And when, when you're, when you're telling me about how you feel about the new rules, please let me know what is your experience with Warhammer Fantasy? Um, so like, did you play Warhammer Fantasy? And if so, what additions did you play? Or did you only play AOS? Or have you only played 40K or Horus Heresy or whatever game it may be? Or none of the above? And this is going to be your first strategy game. Um, and also, let me know, do you think you're going to play this? Or are you still on the fence? Or are you definitely not going to play? Um, I, I really, really am eager to hear y'all's thoughts about if you're like, oh yeah, this looks awesome. Like I'm going to play Tomb Kings. I'm so excited. Or if maybe you're like, eh, I kind of want to wait to see what the minis look like and how like supported the range is. Or if you're like, no, they don't have Lizardmen and Dark Elves in at the beginning. So fuck that. I'm going to wait until those are added. Um, I really would love to get kind of an idea about where everybody's heads are at in regards to this game. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more about it in the coming video. So, uh, there'll be a video a day, um, for as much as I can do that. So, uh, y'all know how I am. So, uh, I will see you tomorrow from when you watch this, uh, where we will talk about the shooting rules, um, which I believe is the next, no movement is next movement is next. So thank you all for watching. I'll see you for some movement. Take care.